Sorry. Sometimes we stay like this for <laughs> hours. Sometimes we stay like this for hours. Alright. Well, it's 1105. Yeah, we can get started. And so, so, so we'll get, go ahead and get started and hopefully they can get the YouTube up and going <laughs> and so forth. Um, so some of you may remember Steve Easterbrook. Um, okay, we're actually online too. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so, uh, some of you may remember Steve Easterbrook. He originally did a sabbatical here in 2010. Um, and one of the things he did back then was he had a project with a student, John Pipitoni, oh, yeah. who was, who was, they were interested in just sort of our techniques for code maintenance and, and also correctness within our code and things like that. And so maybe he can tell you a little bit about the results of that study. Um, but he's a professor at University of Toronto and has been focused a lot on computing and correctness. Um, and he actually happens to be in town for the reproducibility um, and correctness workshop uh, for the next two days. Um, originally got his PhD from Imperial College London, um, but recently got Canadian citizenship. He's been in Canada long enough. So, so anyway, and also on a personal note, he has one of the most remarkable collections of tie-dye shirts I've seen from anyone. So, um, so anyway, but he has a, a new book, Computing the Climate, um, and he actually has some extra copies here to purchase if you're interested in it. But basically, um, he's going to talk about some of the details that are in his book. And Steve, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, no, delighted to be here again. It's been, I haven't been here uh, since before the pandemic. So uh, good, to, good to see it. Good to see everybody again. Um, so this is perhaps an unusual talk for me. It's, uh, I feel like I'm on a book tour. It's lovely. Um, I get to... Uh, get to come and uh, talk about the book. Um, so what I really want to do today is give you kind of a sense of what's in the book, but also my goals in writing it. And I know I did come and give, a, some of you might have been there, a brown bag talk uh, 2019, 2018, when I was kind of in the early stages of writing it, kind of setting out the vision. So I get to, it's nice, I get to come back and say, OK, it's done. Here's, here's what it's all about. So. Um, and this was a challenge for me writing because, uh, you know, I'm an academic. I know how to write uh, scientific papers. Um, what I set myself for this book was a challenge of a different kind of writing, kind of the, the popular science genre. And I felt there was a, there's a big gap um, out there. There is no book out there aimed at a general audience that explains what climate models are, what scientists do with them. And, and I felt it would be really useful to have such a book. You know, if you hang around on social media, sooner or later, someone will say, oh, it's all bunkum. It's based on these computer models. They don't know what they're doing. And I thought, OK, all right. If I could put a book in somebody's hands, not that the people that will say that will necessarily read such a book, but anyway. Um, and then I got started, and my editor reminded me that if you're writing a book in the popular science genre, your audience is people who pick up pop sci books to read for fun, which automatically rules out a large fraction of the population, right? So, uh, but that was kind of freeing because it meant that I don't have to explain things to people that kind of have no science literacy whatsoever. Um, the people that I need, it's kind of a geeky audience, right? It's people that will lap up learning about the science, but who don't know any of the climate science specifics. So what I've tried to do in the book is, is kind of balance the language between um, um, enough detail for people that really want to understand what's going on, but avoiding the jargon. Um, like, there's no equations in this book. Um, actually, it's not quite true. There's a few in the, in the footnotes. But in the, in the main text, I thought, no equations. If there's a relationship I'm trying to explain, I want to explain it kind of at the conceptual level. What are the quantities? That the, that the equation relates. So that anybody that kind of looks at the mathematical notation and, and says, ah, I have no idea what that's saying, will still be able to read the narrative and get a sense of, oh, yeah, OK, I get it. And my goal was really to get people to understand it kind of at the gut level. So if people read it and come away thinking, yeah, I understand at the gut level now 
what the, the core things going on in the models are, how they're put together, and, uh, and who builds them, and how they're used. Um, so one of, one of my measures for whether I've succeeded uh, is uh, after I published the book, I sent a copy to my mum, who's a school teacher, was a school teacher before she retired. And I thought, if my mum enjoys it, then I've won. And she sent me back this really gushing email a couple of weeks later. Later, She says, I rushed through the first two chapters of the book, and I love it. <laughs> so, oh, great, that's a win. <laughs> that's a win. All right. So, um, yeah, just a couple of strategies as I'm writing. One is I spent a lot of time playing with narrative structure. And again, this, was, this for me was new. I had to kind of learn how to do this kind of writing. Um, so each chapter kind of has a narrative hook. And I've woven together the stuff that I'm talking about in ways that I think make for a compelling story uh, that draws people in and kind of makes people want to get, keep reading. So there's a little bit of a, a, a suspense narrative in each of the chapters. Like I'll present um, a, key, a key moment in like the history of climate modeling and then pose the question like, how did they do that? How did they achieve that? And then I've got like flashbacks for some of the science that it's based on. I was trying very much to avoid, I've got some historical chapters, and I'll show you the, the contents listing in a moment. I've got some historical chapters, and I really wanted to avoid the kind of telling things in historical order as though the field just naturally builds up from you know, early discoveries. Uh, it's kind of like a technological determinism argument when it's presented in that way. And I didn't want to do that. So yeah, I had to, I had to play around with uh, narrative structures. I suspect I have left too much detail in the book, certainly for some of the potential audience, but we'll, we'll find out. Um, yeah, and I focused on, I didn't want to say, here's what the science tells us. I wanted to, to focus on, here's how we know the things that we know. So that's the, that was my key goal for the book. Um, there's a bunch of themes that emerged from the book that are um, kind of as I've learned my way into climate modeling um, that have emerged for me um, as, uh, as observations of what I've seen. So let me tell you a little bit about my background as well for those that, that don't know. I originally trained as a computer scientist um, and as a software engineer, and I taught software engineering for a lot, uh, long time my early early career. Um, but I've also trained in research methods from social sciences and anthropology. So when I'm studying software engineering teams, my favorite research method is to act as the anthropologist, go in and you know, an anthropologist will wander around kind of observing human behavior. Like what, what do people do? What are their, what are their rituals? What, are, what tools are they using? How are they using them? And that's a really interesting way of understanding technical communities because you focus on what's strange. And if you come from outside the community, which I did when I started this work, everything is strange. Well, not everything. There's stuff I know. I, don't, I know the basics of, of computing, for example. But stuff that is um, unusual, perhaps, to the climate science community, I would pick up on and say, I've never seen that elsewhere. Tell me more about it. Um, and that was, for me, the journey into it. Um, I did, um, hang on a sec, let me, I've got my slides out of order here. I started out, um, as David said, I, I did uh, um, a long visit here in 2010, um, but I visited, that year I visited uh, three other places as well, Max Planck in Hamburg, uh, UK Met Office in uh, Exeter, and IPSL in Paris. So I spent uh, at least a month at each site, sometimes longer, and kind of, using that method, kind of following people around, sitting in on meetings, kind of noting, uh, noting what was going on. What emerged from that, and this is what I've tried to do in the book, is pick up on these themes. First of all, this observation, for me as an outsider coming, coming into this community, climate models are an incredible engineering achievement. Like, if you explain to somebody what goes into uh, you know, the latest version of CESM, who knows nothing about its history. It's like, how could this possibly work, right? We're simulating so many complex uh, phenomena on planet Earth. How can we possibly get a model to do all of that? It is an incredible engineering achievement that it runs at all. Um, so I wanted to tell the story of that achievement and the engineering processes that go into it. Um, I also wanted to tell the kind of sociological story here, that modern Earth system models become a focus for interdisciplinary collaboration 
in a way that just can't happen without the, without the model. That different communities build the components and then bring them together and you can couple them and you can run experiments that touch on all sorts of different aspects of Earth, Earth system science and study the feedback loops and study how the different systems affect each other. That to me is a really fascinating story and I wanted to get that across in the book as well. Um, and then I kind of close out the book, the last, the last chapter in particular, the last big chapter, um, is the, how do we know the models are right? So I focused on a whole bunch of different practices that I've observed at the modeling centers that I've visited that build up this understanding of how do we know what the model's doing when it's running? How do we know that it's valid? And there's a whole question of what valid means, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, and this idea as well, I use this quote quite a lot in the book. You, you're all familiar with it, George Box, right? All models are wrong, but some are useful. And this, this understanding that we always know the model is a simplification of really complex processes, and yet it gives us deep insights into what those processes are. So I wanted to get that story across as well. So here's the, here's the chapter plan. Um, I've got kind of, the, I introduced the, the, the book with what I identified, I don't know if you guys would agree with me, but for me this was one of the key moments in the history of climate science, the Charney Report in 1979, which established Charney sensitivity as a key metric for understanding climate models and how to compare them, and was really the first moment when people started to compare different models from different labs as opposed to kind of everybody doing their own thing in their own research labs and, and not worrying about how you share. So to me, that was kind of the birth of a community of modelers willing to run the same experiments on all their different models. And of course, that leads to the model intercomparison projects um, build up from there. So I've got three historical chapters. Uh, the first one focuses on Arrhenius's original climate model in the 1890s. Um, and I realized that if you read any history of climate science, they talk about Arrhenius, they talk about his model, and they say, oh yeah, and he predicted if you double uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you get about five degrees of warming, and that's remarkably close to modern IPCC assessments. And wasn't that amazing? And they don't tell you what's in his model. So I thought, great, I'll take that on as a challenge. So, so that chapter is quite a long chapter, but it dives down deep into his model, how it was put together, where he got his data from, and also the weaknesses in the model, because there are two very, very serious flaws in that model that almost no one ever talks about. So I had fun kind of unearthing those and uh, telling that story. Um, next chapter just talks about the birth of numerical weather forecasting, uh, the end of the Second World War and into the 1950s. Um, and then, of course, that leads naturally to the birth of global circulation models. And then I have a chapter where I really get into the question of predictability. And I wanted to, I wanted to dive deep into the, all right, what's the difference between weather prediction uh, uh, and climate modeling and tell the story of the discovery of chaos theory along the way. So those, that's my historical part. The second half of the book, I had fun weaving together uh, stories of my visits to each of those four labs with various themes that I wanted to pick out and talk about in detail. So it's not the case that, uh, you know, experiments, I only observed experiments happening at NCAR, I only uh, observed um, the dynamical core being built at the Med Office. I observed these things all over the place, but I kind of used them as hooks to show off what I observed in some of those labs and use that to bring out the themes of the book and trying to think if there's anybody in here. that I, 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 I use a few of my interviews with people I met at each of those four places, and I introduce their work. And I like to talk about the people behind the work as well. OK. Um, and the hardest chapter to write was the last one, or the, the so what chapter. Like I attempted to do in about 10,000 words, what do the models tell us about the future? Um, anyway. So let me dive in. Um, I'm going to give you a few glimpses from the book to give you a sense of what's in there. And actually, I'll read a couple of little expert excerpts as well, give you a sense of, of um, the style I adopted in writing it. Actually, before I proceed, any, any questions so far? Does that all make sense? Okay, all right. So I start out chapter two 
with this story of uh, Svante Arrhenius's climate model. Actually, yeah, let me, let me read a segment, because this is, I had, I had real fun writing this chat. I had a lot of fun writing this book. It took me like seven years to write. Uh, and um, the other thing is, of course, I kind of feel it's a little out of date already, uh, especially with all the work coming down the line on uh, bringing machine learning into climate modeling, especially what's happened over the last year. I felt I finished writing this a year ago, and so much has happened since then, anyway. <laughs> all right, here's how chapter two starts. In the late 19th century, Sweden was considered a backwater by most European scientists. Promising students hoped for positions in research labs in Germany, France, or Austria. But in Stockholm, in the early 1890s, a small group of scientists were laying the foundations for a new field of science. They met every fortnight at the Stockholm Cosmic Physics Society to consider big questions about our planet, how geological and cosmic processes help shape the conditions for life on Earth. This group of scientists was remarkably diverse. Geologists from the Swedish Geological Survey came to discuss the geological eras of the past. Weather forecasters from the Meteorological Office came to discuss the forces that shape weather patterns. Biologists from the, from the Museum of Natural History came to discuss fossil records and evolution. Astronomers came to discuss comparisons between the Earth and other planets and moons. In the group were two remarkable young scientists, Svante Arrhenius and Wilhelm Björknes. Both served as lecturers in the early 1890s at the Stockholm Hogskola, which later became the University of Stockholm, and both were promoted to professors of physics in the same year, 1895. Birkness was a mathematician, mathematical physicist with interest in mag mag magnetic fields and fluids. And we'll come back to his work in more detail in chapter three, because of course his work laid the foundation for numerical weather forecasting. Arrhenius was a chemist who went on to win a Nobel Prize for his research on acids. Both were inspired to apply their work to weather and climate by the discussions at the meetings of the society. And then I go on to describe what they were doing. So in 1894, uh, this guy came to give a talk at one of their meetings, Arvin Hergbom, and he gave a talk about the carbon cycle. He'd identified seven different sources of carbon in the atmosphere and four, I've got the number right, three or four, I can't remember, three or four different sinks. And he gave this whole talk about where carbon comes from and where it goes. Um, and then uh, a couple of months later, uh, Nils Ek Ekholm, who had just returned from uh, an expedition to Spitsbergen, which is kind of up in the Arctic Circle, um, came to give a talk about uh, all the evidence about the ice ages. And at the end of Ekholm's talk, there's a whole discussion within the society about what might have caused the ice ages. This was the big the kind of big scientific mystery of the time. What caused the ice ages? And especially in, in a place like Stockholm where the evidence is all around them, um, you know, you go back uh, uh, to the ice ages and, and this was a place that was completely covered in uh, two kilometer thick glaciation. Um, Arrhenius, oh actually several people asked, oh, I've skipped a step, several people asked Hugbom at the end of his talk whether he thought that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere might change over time, might have changed in history. And he thought about it for a while, and he said, no, I can't think of any source that would make a substantial difference in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, except maybe volcanoes, if a very large number of volcanoes went off all at once, and that was the only thing he could think of that would make a substantial difference. But Arrhenius kind of connected the two together and said, what if there was less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere during the ice ages? Wouldn't that explain the temperature variations? And I kind of pick up on this in the book. That's a really remarkable question. Like, how would he even think to ask that question in the first place? And the answer is, the greenhouse effect is actually reasonably well understood at this time, end of the 19th century. The original um, ideas about the energy, energy plan, plan, balance of the planet had been worked out by uh, Joseph Fourier at the beginning of the 19th century. And of course, the experimental evidence for the absorption, absorption properties of greenhouse gases had been worked out by Tyndall in the 1850s. So we've got experimental evidence of the properties of these gases. We've got an understanding of the energy balance of the planet as a whole, but a bit of a mystery as to what the actual mechanism is. How exactly do these gases trap outgoing heat? But the theory is they trap outgoing heat from the planet. So Arrhenius is kind of bringing all of this together 
and, and he proposes to build them all. Everybody says he's crazy. Like, no, it can't possibly be the case that this gas would, would vary that much to make a difference. He says, oh, I'm going to prove it. He spent an entire year doing all the calculations by hand, of course, no computers at the time. Oh, it, it's fun, right? But back then, the word computer actually meant a human who sits and does calculations, right? So he was a computer for a year. All right. So, um, uh, yeah, here's Arrhenius, uh, and I said, all right, there. So let, let me go on and explain the model. So here was my challenge in the book. I wanted to explain his model to an audience that has none of the background. How do I do that? My first attempt looked like this. <laughs> all right, so this is, this is Arrhenius' model, and the key thing, of course, that he's realized and that was like forgotten for the next 60 years, is the energy balance at the top of the atmosphere is what matters. And he's kind of captured that in a key equation. He's got incoming sunlight, and he's got the outgoing uh, sources of energy. Uh, he's got radiation uh, from the ground in the, in the long wave. He's got the short wave coming in. He's got reflected sunlight. He knows albedo matters. Uh, he's got horizontal heat flows that he says, I know nothing about those, so I'll just treat those as constants. He doesn't know how to measure the solar constant, so he says, I'll just treat that as an unknown constant. Um, and of course, we've got the Stefan Boltzmann equation buried in there somewhere. Now, I assume for this audience, I don't have to explain any of that. For the book I did, I, I, I don't give the Stefan Boltzmann equation, but I talk, about the, I talk about its discovery, and I talk about what it actually means without actually giving the equation, although it is in, in one of the footnotes. So this is my first attempt, and I showed this to my students, and they scratched their heads for a while, and they said, you've got to do better. Um, so this is the diagram that ended up in the book. And this is the one, I think, that's closest to me giving an equation anywhere, but it's a, it's a word equation rather than a mathematical, notion, uh, a mathematical no notation equation. And I said, this is essentially how he did it. He worked out what that equation is at the top of the atmosphere, and uh, I'm assuming, actually, most of you don't know how Arrhenius is model. I, I give talks to all sorts of folks in climate science. Nobody knows how Arrhenius is model worked. All right, so here's what he did. He took uh, the horizontal heat flows as a constant. He took the uh, solar constant as a constant. He says, I'm going to assume nothing I do changes those things. Kind of rearrange the equations to bundle that as a single unknown. And then he calibrates his model using um, weather records that kind of map out. He actually has a grid over the, oh, I didn't include the grid. So his grid is uh, 20 degrees of longitude by 10 degrees of latitude, because there are published weather, um, uh, weather data on that grid that he can pick up. And the weather data gives him kind of by season, what's the average ground temperature in that grid cell in that season. Um, He's got, and it's got kind of typical humidity. Uh, it's got, uh, what else is in there? It's got winds and so on. He doesn't include those in his model. Um, so he's got all this weather data. So he runs the model, when I say runs the model, sits and does the calculations once to calibrate it to give him that unknown. And then he runs it again for different levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And again, this is what, how, right? How does he do that? He's got this data source that came from, um, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name now, Langley. What was Langley's first name? Uh, Pierpoint was his middle name, whatever it is. It doesn't matter what his name is. Langley, who was actually the same Langley that the NASA Langley Center is named after, um, who was quite an inventor as well. He, he uh, tried to invent flight and tried to beat the Wright brothers at building the first aircraft and had a catapult for the takeoff, and of course, it didn't work. Um, but he'd spent five years as director at the Allegheny Observatory in Pittsburgh and had been attempting to measure the temperature of the moon. And so in order to do that, he'd invented this instrument it's called a bolometer that has um, a, a rock salt prism in it to separate the wavelengths of infrared. And he's got um, about 20, 22 different measurements across the infrared spectrum where he can measure the energy from any object that's radiating infrared. So he points this thing at the moon over, you know, for lots and lots of different times over a period of five years and records the wavelengths across the spectrum that he's getting. Um, and he also records things like you know, the local humidity uh, at the time, the local weather conditions. So Arrhenius picks up on this data set and says, I can calculate the coefficients of water vapor uh, 
and carbon dioxide based on how they affect the absorption across the spectrum. Because when the moon's at different heights in the atmosphere, in the sky, it's, it's passed through different thicknesses of atmosphere. So he says, well, that gives me my different levels of carbon dioxide. And he's got the humidity measurements, which gives me the changing levels of water vapor. So he says, right, my two key, two key greenhouse gases, water vapor and carbon dioxide, I've got a whole series of measurements that give me variations of them and what that does to infrared across the spectrum. And he's doing a kind of very primitive line-by-line -line analysis um, for the IR, and he computes then this huge big table of coefficients for the two gases that he can then put into the model and say, um, you know, his, his emissivity is the key, uh, the key variable there that he'll tweak. And so he can ask questions like, if you reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere down to two thirds of its level at the time, what would that do to the ground temperature? And he says, it would, it would cool the Earth by about five degrees, and that would be enough to trigger an ice age. Uh, and then he said, if you double it, it would warm the planet by five to six degrees. And maybe one, and he writes this in his papers, maybe one day it's a nice thought to imagine that carbon dioxide produced from burning coal might warm the planet and make a place like Stockholm a much more pleasant environment. And he says, this is going to be a good thing. And it will take you know, maybe 500 years for any, any effect to be noticeable. Um, so he's completely misunderstood how industrial society is going to evolve over the 20th century. Like, how could you know in, at the end of the 19th century what we're going to do in terms of fossil fuels? Um, but he predicts climate change. Um, his model predicts a number of other things which are, which are really neat. He predicts polar amplification. He, he very clearly shows in his results that the poles would warm faster than the equatorial regions. Uh, he predicts nighttime temperatures would rise faster than daytime temperatures. He predicts the land surface temperatures would rise faster than the oceans, all of which, of course, are correct predictions. And it comes from essentially getting the conceptual structure of the model right, uh, even though his data turns out to be complete rubbish. Actually, not complete rubbish. There's, there's some very serious weaknesses in his data. He's got the wavelengths wrong. He's missed the key absorption band for carbon dioxide. Um, and you guys are climate scientists. You guys know what else is wrong with this model. He's treated the atmosphere as a single thing with a single temperature. There's no, uh, there's no lapse rate in here. And you can't get the greenhouse effect properly if you don't have the, the vertical structure of the atmosphere. So I actually got a group of my students to re-implement his model a couple of years ago in Python. Um, and we got all his original, all of his, all of his data sets are all laid out in, the paper, in his papers. It's all, it's all open data. And as far as I know, nobody's ever done this before. So my students had fun putting it together. I need to write a paper and publish it. It's in the book, but I need to put it in BAMS or somewhere like that. They'll appreciate it. Um, we re-implemented his model with his data and replicated his re results exactly. So he didn't make mistakes in the calculations. Um, he got the right results for his data. And then we put modern radiation data into the model, and you get a completely different result. You basically get almost no warming. You get like 0.1 of a degree of warming for doubled carbon dioxide. And that's because there's no vertical structure here. You can't get all right. So that demonstrates, first of all, that um, um, his infrared radiation data is just its rubbish. It wasn't doing what he wanted to do. In fact, Langley warned him at the time that the data wasn't good enough for what he was trying to do. And he said, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, now, here's the other thing. Arrhenius knew about the fundamental weakness about the vertical structure. And he writes in one of his papers that uh, he knows this is a simplification. And he tries a two-layer version of his model. Basically, he takes this model and he stacks one above the other. So he's now got two different heights in the atmosphere, two different temperatures. Uh, emission of radiation from the lower level feeds into radiation in the upper level. And he does that two-layer thing. And he says, it makes so little difference, I'm just going to ignore it. And it's so complicated to calculate, I'm just going to do the one layer. So he knew that, about that weakness in his model. And he kind of convinced himself it didn't matter. But of course, it does matter. Um, one of the other things my students did with their, their re-implementation, their Python model, is they built a 17-layer version of the model. You just stack the model one up, one up and above, above each other. F fairly straightforward to do. And then we got about one degree of warming for doubling CO2, which I think is pretty good. I think that's kind of what you'd expect. You've got no feedbacks in this model. Um, 
And actually, Arrhenius knew all about the feedbacks. He actually did one-step water vapor feedback in his model. So he'd run the model once, adjust the humidity, and then run it again to kind of do a very quick simulation of water vapor feedback. So he knew all about feedbacks, and he knew he just didn't have the, the computational tools to compute them, but he knew about them. Anyway, lovely story. So I've got a whole chapter that sets out that story, uh, talks about the model, talks about what he knew, but it's also a nice way of showing that a model with deep flaws can still give you some interesting and useful predictions, even though there's these big errors in the model, just because some of the conceptual structure is right. Okay. This is one of my favorite diagrams from the book. This is basically the map of all the stuff I stuffed into chapter two, kind of all of the findings. So I start off with Arrhenius and his asking this question, and then I have these flashbacks that tell you these are the pieces of work that he drew on to put that model together. So, so the whole thing is a story of how you put together a model using data that's available, using bits of theory, using experimental evidence, and bringing them all into a single computational model. Okay. Actually, pause for questions. Any questions about the bit of history? All right. Skip forward in time. All right. End of the Second World War and the birth of digital computing. I get to talk. So this is now chapter three. I get to talk in that model uh, a lot about Moore's Law and how kind of every... Uh, every year, 18 months, we get a, a machine that's faster, and uh, the, the kind of history of climate modeling follows that history of the computational resources available, and the fact that, you know, as soon as you get a faster computer, what do you do? You increase the resolution in the model. Uh, anyway, back to the late 1940s. Um, uh, John von Neumann, um, who had already built quite a reputation for his work in numerical mathematics, um, working at the Los Alamos project on dispersion models for radiation after a nuclear explosion, goes on a tour during the war to find out who's building computers that could run his, uh, run his simulations on. Comes across ENIAC purely because uh, one of the army captains who was working on the project recognized von Neumann at a, tra at a train station and stuck uh, struck up a conversation with him, and ENIAC says, you're building what? I want to I come. And so kind of within a month, he had arranged a visit of ENIAC. And then realizes, uh, I like to describe this to my students, what's the killer app for ENIAC? It's weather forecasting, right? So, so he hires uh, uh, Jules Charney um, at the recommendation of Rosby. He got Rosby to consult on this project. Actually, he tried to persuade Ros Rosby to move to Princeton and work on him with this. Rosby, busy doing other things, but says, hey, I've got this great student, Charney. Um, uh, von Neumann hires him, and Charney builds the first weather model. This was his grid um, for the ENIAC experiments. Um, so he's got this People know about the, 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 what that first model was, the first Chani model. It's essentially a single variable at each grid point. It's geopotential height at 500 millibars. Um, and then I, the book, I have to explain, well, what does that actually mean, right? Okay, it's halfway up in the atmosphere. Think about that. It's a surface. Um, and they took over ENIAC for it. They, they negotiated with the army who were using ENIAC to do ballistics calculations that they could take over that computer for a month and they managed to do four 24-hour weather forecasts in that month on ENIAC. It's all stacked punch cards. At each step in the calculation, it spits out punch cards, and they've got to resort them and feed them back in again to do the next step. That's why it takes a month. Um, and three of the, they're, they're doing hindcasts. Three of the hindcasts are completely wrong, completely uh, implausible. And one of them, kind of, if you squint at it, you can say, yeah, it's not bad. And of course, Chan, and it, and it took, uh, remember my numbers here, it took about uh, 36 hours of compute time to do a 12 hour forecast. And uh, von Neumann and Charney says, wow, that's amazing, great, we, we've cracked it. Because they realize all they need is a faster machine. And, and they can keep ahead of the real weather. And kind of that's the instant insight. As soon as they get that, that thing running, they say, if we get a faster machine, we can go faster than the real weather. We can do real forecasting. And von Neumann, let me go back to my picture of von Neumann. He, he's a really interesting character. Um, 
he goes to the army and sells them on the idea that if you can manipulate the weather, you get a massive battlefield advantage. And so the army should pour massive amounts of money into his program to do weather forecasting because what he essentially wants to do is weather manipulation. And he sells the army on uh, this idea that weather manipulation is the thing that they should be focusing on. And then within five years, we have operational weather forecasting by numerical models. It was a really, really fast uptake of this modeling into the weather service offering uh, numerical weather forecasts. But then, of course, what, other, what else came out of that work at Princeton? Um, Norm Phillips, who takes that, actually, it wasn't, he, he took a two-layer version of Charney's model, but it's the same thing. It's essentially one variable, but now at two levels in the atmosphere. And he wraps round the ends of it to join the east edge of the, of the grid up to the west edge of the grid in a cylinder doesn't worry about you know, what's going on at the poles, doesn't want to worry about polar convergence problems and what that does to your grid. That's way too complicated. Um, and starts the model from rest. Spins it up over a month-long run and, realize, and crashes at about a month, so we can't go longer than that. But he managed to get at least one month running and realized in that time, from rest, the model started to, to mimic the jet stream. And now, of course, he's, he's corrected for gravity. I don't know how you correct for gravity on a cylinder. Anyway, he does, he does things, and the Coriolis force is in there as a kind of artificial Coriolis force. Uh, so he starts to get a realistic jet stream. And von Neumann is so excited by this, he says, we can now do an infinite weather forecast. We can keep these models running forever and just compute weather over a year over multiple years. He says, we've cracked it. Of course, what he doesn't realize <laughs> is, because they don't know about chaos theory at this point, what he doesn't realize uh, is the growth of errors in the model uh, over time from a, an initial forecast. Anyway, but that's the birth of general circulation modeling. And by the mid-1960s, 1965, let's say, we've got three major groups with kind of uh, global, uh, global circulation models up and running, very, very simple global circulation models up and running, but an ongoing program of research in them, and they're training students to work with these models. And of course, um, the original one is Philip's model, which led into uh, Smagorinsky, who is at this point now head of the Weather Bureau, picking up that model, hires um, Manabi and uh, I remember their first names, Kirk Bryan. Um, of course, they go on to build the first coupled atmosphere ocean model in the 1970s, and they also go on to run the first um, doubled carbon dioxide experiment on that model. So the first time to really replicate what Arrhenius was doing in the 19th century, but now with the structure of the atmosphere, the vertical structure of the atmosphere, right? Um, and then I, I've got a whole chapter on the birth of the community model at NCAR, which was fun to write as well. Let me, you know what? Maybe I'll read a, another little, yeah, we've got time. I'll read another little. I got to dig through the archives at NCAR. I got to spend time in the library here looking through all these archives. Anybody, anybody know about the Blue Book? One, two, three, four. Okay, people know about the Blue Book. Good. All right. Um, so I'm basically talking about this notion that you could build a community model. Uh, I'm going to jump right into the middle here. It took a long time to grow a community of this. I don't know, I've got to go back a bit. Hang on a sec. Uh, yeah, I took about open source software because it's one of my hobby horses. The, the vast majority of open source software, however, turns out not to be useful to anyone other than the people that built it. A lot of the software on open source code sharing sites has, in effect, no community of users at all. And there's a footnote here to some research where they show, you know, there's this power law, like 90% of the projects have one user, and it's the <laughs> person that built the thing, right? Uh, a very small handful of projects have thousands of users, while thousands of projects have only a very small handful of users. In this context, CESM is clearly a runaway success. The few hundred scientists who come each year to the annual CESM workshop represent only a tip of the iceberg. Uh, these numbers are going to be wrong now. Over 6,000 scientists have registered to download and new, use CESM, and the number is growing rapidly. In the last couple of years, this number grew about by about 900 per year. 
Many of these users register so they can download and install CESM on a shared computing facility where many other scientists will have access to it. The CESM online discussion groups regularly attract tens of thousands of participants. It took a long time to grow a community of this size, and then I do a little flashback, right? So it didn't used to be like this. When climate modeling first began at NCAR in the 1960s, there was no such community. The first generations of models could only be used at NCAR, and while NCAR was happy for scientists to come and visit and work with the models, in the early days, very few scientists ever did. Perhaps surprisingly, the study of climate was not even part of NCAR's mission when it was founded in 1960. At the time, there was really no such thing yet as climate science. The idea that the climate was changing due to human activities was only known to a handful of scientists, and their work was largely ignored as implausible by the mainstream atmospheric science and meteorology communities. Um, where do we go? I, I, I'm gonna give you this last part here. Um, so the Blue Book argued a national center would provide a coordinated interdisciplinary approach to the study of the atmosphere on a scale not possible in individual universities and suggested a research, event, a research agenda covering four main areas, which I, I'm gonna relabel as motion, heat, water, and other things. <laughs> All right, so finally, under other physical processes, the Blue Book identified things whose effect on the atmosphere was poorly understood at the time, including sound waves, electrical currents, and chemical re reactions in the atmosphere. It is only here that the report acknowledges the possibility of a human impact, noting the unsolved question of whether the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere is increasing as a result of combustion processes and the even more elusive question as to possible changes in the Earth's electrical field as a result of nuclear explosions. So it's mentioned in there as something that they might investigate. And then I get to talk about these two guys. Uh, and I love the picture that I dug up here. So that's Warren Washington and Akira Kasahara. And I talk about their story of them being hired. They both had some familiarity with numerical modeling uh, of glo and um, global circulation models before they came to NCAR. And uh, they sat down with... Um, Bill, is it Bill Thompson? Phil Thompson, sorry, I got his name wrong. They sat down with Phil Thompson, who was their boss, and over lunch one day, they, they present to, to Phil, we want to build, a, I don't think they use the word community model, but we want to build a model that all sorts of scientists can come and run experiments on and contribute to. And apparently, I got this from one of the interviews with, um, uh, with Kasahara, um, Phil Thompson basically raised his eyebrows twice, and that was the symbol that, yes, I agree, this is a great project, go ahead. <laughs> and by the way, we've just bought a brand new computer, and you can have it for your, your experiments. So there you go, that's the birth of uh, climate modeling at NCAR. Um, one of my students a few years back, a few of you might know Caitlin Alexander, um, is now at the British Antarctic Survey uh, as a postdoc. Um, she did a... a an analysis of the software architecture of a whole bunch of the models. This was a, in, during CMIP5, so maybe a little dated now. But like, what's the top level software architecture uh, of a climate model? And there's a set of diagrams in this book. This is one of them. This is the CESM. So which one's this? This is CSM1. Um, showing you, and the, the bubbles are scaled by number of lines of code. And we realize that number of lines of code is kind of a proxy for how much science has gone into this. It's not a perfect proxy. There's all sorts of reasons why lines of code is, is dubious as a measure of anything. Um, although actually, you know, software engineers have studied this and they said, you can come up with all sorts of pathological examples to show that deleting lines of code actually gives you a better, a better piece of software. But overall, if you study most software systems, actually lines of code is a really good measure of how much work and how much, how much functionality something has. So what's interesting about this, oh, I should have put the other ones in to show you a comparison. The models all have, slight, have different architectures. And they have different architectures for a reason. So the NCAR model kind of has what I call a star architecture. Like almost everything in interaction between the different components goes through the coupler. Um, and that's for a reason, that's because this is a community model and kind of that modularity, keeping the separation between the modules is really important. If you look at the diagram for the UK Met Office, theirs is basically completely dominated by the atmosphere which calls almost everything else except for the ocean. So there's a coupler that connects atmosphere and ocean, but they don't use the coupler for anything else. 
So and why is that? That's because they unified the operational weather forecasting and the climate modeling into a single code base, and it's operational weather forecasting that really drives the development of that model, and it's essentially an atmosphere model that they've built, and they're a big community of experts in atmospheric modeling. And any other pieces in there for climate science are kind of like you know, second-class citizens to some extent. Um, Anyway, so yes, so I get to talk in the book. Oh, here's the other, here's the other fun thing. Let me do maybe one more little reading. Um, so each of those four chapters where I talk about uh, my visits to different labs, I start out the chapter with kind of me visiting, and I talk about the buildings. I talk about this building we're in, the design by I.M. Pai, how he wanted it to look like it was carved out of the pinkish rock. Um, and the fact that there's all these twisting corridors that everybody gets lost on because he wanted it to be interesting, and how every office is a different size because he realized different scientists do different things, and there's hardly any windows because he wanted lots of walls to pin up all your diagrams and, and things. So, okay, all right. Um, uh, I talk about when I arrive at IPSL in Paris. I don't know how many folks have visited IPSL. When I first visited there, it was truly awful. It's the, the whole building, um, is like this grid of, of um, uh, 1960s office buildings, hideous looking thing, raised above the ground, so there's just a central pillar at each junction point, and you've got the winds blow across this concrete slab, it's surrounded by a dry concrete moat, and there's all this barbed wire, and it looks like a prison yard. And the wind is blowing through it, there's litter everywhere, there's graffiti all over the concrete structures. I said, this is hideous but at least I get to hang out in the Latin Quarter in the cafes in Paris when I'm visiting. And then I went back six or seven years later, and they'd kind of reskinned a large, they'd done a greening of the campus, they'd reskinned a lot of the buildings, they'd closed in some of the open spaces, they'd put roofs over some of the, the open squares, and they'd built a, built a whole load of enclosed student study spaces, and it's beautiful. And I get to use that as a metaphor for how buildings change over time to adapt to the needs of their users. And then I jump into, oh yeah, we do that with software as well. So I use the architecture of the buildings. I'm like, these buildings are all different. And the models are all different. They have the same goal. So the, the goal of each building is to house uh, a community of climate scientists and the work that they do on their modeling. The models all essentially have the same level of goal. We want to simulate the climate system uh, and run experiments on it, but they all differ in these subtle ways and they all evolve over time and their structures evolve over time. So I use the buildings as a metaphor. I'm not gonna read that, I've got too many, too many excerpts from the book. Um, and we're nearly out of time. So let me uh, scroll forward a little bit. Um, people might have seen versions of this diagram before. There's a, there's a version of this diagram in one of the IPCC reports. This is my own kind of reconstruction of it. Um, but, but in the chapter on coupling, uh, coupled models, how do you actually bring these components together and couple them? I talk all, all about these architectural decisions. Uh, I tell the story of that first attempt to couple an atmosphere model with an ocean model and how each of them worked brilliantly on its own and could simulate 20th century climate and you put them together and they cause each other to drift completely uh, out and you had to put these artificial flux corrections in in order to get the coupled model stable. And there was about a 20 year period in the history of coupled models where nobody could get a stable simulation run without these artificial flux corrections and a huge debate about whether it's reasonable to do climate change experiments on a coupled model with flux corrections in it. Um, and then I talk about the solution to the flux correction problem, and I get to talk about parameterization schemes and, and uh, the kind of empirical tuning of model. Anyway, there's a whole lot that I get to talk about. Um, and um, yeah, you know what? Oh, yeah, but one more thing before I wrap up. Um, I didn't put this diagram in the book, and in, in hindsight, I should have. This is straight out of um, the sixth assessment report, the chapter on models. Um, the point to show you this, of course, is that modern day, you know this, modern day climate modeling is a massive global enterprise with modeling centers all over the world running the same experiments on their models. And I get to claim in the book, and nobody's contradicted me yet, that this is the largest shared computational experiment ever performed. The CMIP experiments are the largest 
shared computational experiment in any field of science. The folks at CERN have argued with me about this. They say, no, 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 we, we do something on the same scale. And the counter argument is, actually, no, they don't. They, they run a large physical experiment with the, the particle smash, I don't know what these things are called, the particle smashers. And they have a huge number of scientists from all over the world come and run those physical experiments. And they do a huge amount of simulations, but the, the simulations aren't a coordinated shared experiment. Everybody's running their own simulations. So they don't have the shared computational uh, experiment culture that climate science has developed. And my argument in the book is this is absolutely fundamental to how we understand the strengths and weaknesses of the model. You, you couldn't do what you do today, certainly in pulling together the IPCC reports and, and kind of under, making sense of, of all of these physical processes without these massive coordinated experiments. All right, that's enough uh, about the book. Um, I'd love it if you buy it. <laughs> feel like I'm a salesman now. This feels awkward. Um, I've, I've got a stack of copies here. Uh, I got the most, the cover price is 30 bucks for the paperback. Um, I can sell them to you at 25 because I got a discount, but I can only take cash. Um, don't worry about it. Um, if you use that code and buy it directly from Cambridge University Press, you get a discount. Um, make me happy. Buy my book. All right. Um, questions? Do we need this mic, or can we use those? OK. Um, so questions for Steve? Right up the back. Monica. Yeah, so it, that was an incredibly interesting talk, because um, the history of climate modeling is kind of a beast, and you've done a, a really nice treatment of it. Um, I'm curious. You said that um, when you were in one of your last comments um, in the comparison of the different architectures and structures that the models have um, and the relation to um, what their purposes are, I'm curious if in any of your examinations across the four centers you were able to detect differences in scientific purposes other than maybe some like shared overarching goals in relation to like CMIP, things like that, but whether there was diversity of purpose that that like you examined or that you picked up on. Um. Yeah, yeah, there was. And it's really hard to pin down, but I do talk about it a little bit. So for example, um, IPS, IPSL, IP, have I got that right? IPSL in Paris, um, their coupled model largely was driven by their paleoclimate studies. And they were one of the first to get an active carbon cycle into the model. And you can kind of almost see that in the architecture, that the carbon cycle really matters uh, in what they were doing. Uh, they were also one of the first to solve the flux correction problem uh, in atmosphere-ocean coupling. And the reason they did that, and the reason they pushed hard on solving that problem, was because in paleoclimate, they really, really wanted uh, to make sure that they weren't doing, they could run the really, really, really long-term experiments uh, for paleoclimate without any of that artificiality. Um, so that shows up a little bit in their architecture, that, that paleoclimate was their big goal. Um, NCAR I've characterized as, it's, it's really the only community model. It's the only community model, at least on the scale that's done at NCAR. And that shows up in the sense that, well, first of all, NCAR is, I believe, the only lab that does exper extensive training. Like, people come here for the workshops and using the model. And that means the model is the most widely used in the world. Um, but then that means there's a lot more modularity in the model to allow people to plug in different components. And that modularity has driven the, the, the development of the model. Um, the German model is really interesting because they, actually they've got two models that I talk about. So they have um, uh, MPIM ES, which is a model that was originally the ECMWF model that was taken and brought into the lab uh, in Hamburg, and then they started developing that themselves. And then in around 2000, they created a new model, the ICON model, which is um, an icohes... Icos uh, I can't pronounce that word. Do it for me. <laughs> Icosahedral model. Um, and um, that's a joint project with the weather forecasting folks. So again, that shapes the development of, of that project. 
Uh, that's a little bit like what, of course, the UK Met Office is doing, where the operational forecasting drives the development of that model. So yeah, four different labs with actually quite distinct goals overriding what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see anything online. Okay, sounds good. Other questions in the room? I don't know. Yeah, just a quick question. You put a lot of thought, I really love your talk, and you put a lot of thought going into the book. I was wondering, this picture, what's... <laughs> uh, I'm sure there is a lot of thought that went into it, and then uh, what is it about? Uh, right, so it's, a it's on the back of the book. It's a sculpture called Home. That's why I need to buy the book. Um, yeah, <laughs> you can find out. Find out and buy the book. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's by a sculpt. I have no idea, actually, who this guy is. Michael Christian. Uh, the, photo the photographer was Gabe Kirschheimer. No, I saw this, it, it actually, I almost feel embarrassed about this. This is a sculpture at Burning Man, for those that know what the Burning Man thing is. It's out, out in the desert, you know, everybody groans, groans, Burning Man, you know that culture, right? Uh, <laughs> forget Burning Man for a moment. I saw a, and it's not this picture, I saw a different picture of it in kind of gray with all the dust in the background. And I thought, that kind of captures the kind of mechanical notion of the models and the fact that it's the globe and it's kind of got human activity on there because this is kind of like a street map imposed on the globe. And I'll, this is all the themes that I'm working on in the book. So in one photograph, I, I, I don't care where the photograph came from. I loved the photograph. <laughs> uh, so maybe one more question. Anybody in the room? Yeah, Isla. Yeah, thanks. It seems like you have a lot of nice diagrams in the book. I'm just wondering if they're available. They seem like they'd be useful for presentations. Oh, I should do that. I'm I, actually I sat down in the summer to put together a little website where I could share like snippets from the book, and I could put the diagrams up on there. And I still haven't done that yet. Um, if you want, I can send them if you want them. Um, but you're right. I should absolutely put them up somewhere for for public availability. Yeah, um, a, a lot of my diagrams I've stolen from elsewhere. So like I've got favorite diagrams, a few of them from the IPCC reports, a few of them are from published papers where I've just reproduced them, and others I've put together myself, and there's some of my own photographs, like all the photos of the labs that are in there, I've taken the photographs myself, so, so some of them are my own. But yeah, that'd be great. I'd be very happy to share them. All right, so Steve's around for the next couple of days. Um, there's a couple slots left to speak to him this afternoon if you'd like. Um, so Daniel had sent out the Google Sheet to sign up. Um, so with that, let's thank Steve again.